Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of On Point at Notre Dame. Our topic today is one that informs everything we do here at the university, and that is Notre Dame's enduring Catholic character. Here today to lead us through this discussion and answer your questions is Father Bill Lees. Father Bill is a Holy Cross priest here on campus, and he's Notre Dame's Vice President for Mission Engagement and Church Affairs. Father Bill, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to be here. I'm delighted to be with your audience as well. Uh, for those of you watching live, I'm just going to quickly run through how today's program is going to work. Initially, Father Bill is going to share his initial thoughts on our topic, and after that, he'll be taking your questions. You can submit your questions in the form directly beneath the streaming player where you're watching us. You can submit the quest questions throughout today's broadcast, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Father Bill, with that, I'll hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Well, it's a delight to be here today. First, I want to tell you sort of how I'm going to structure my comments. Um, first, I want to start by saying a little bit about myself so that you'll get an idea of who's droning on and on in front of you. <laughs> then I'd like to take the time to uh, walk through a little history of Notre Dame with a particular attention to Holy Cross's role in developing the university. And it's my understanding that the, um, the university, the, the folks who watch this, um, some are very familiar with the university and some are less familiar. So. Um, I will uh, do my best to, to cover the bases, and uh, some of you will, this will be new to. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where we are today, and uh, especially now as we begin our 175th year uh, here at the University of Notre Dame. So as Kevin mentioned, I'm Father Bill Lease, a Holy Cross priest. I'm originally from Little Falls, Minnesota. It's, it's the boyhood home of Charles Lindbergh and me. <laughs> and my nine siblings. So I'm the, the ninth of ten kids. Um, I have a twin brother who is uh, Jim Lease. He, if you can believe this, is also a, a Holy Cross priest. In fact, he is the vice president for mission at Stonehill College, which is just south of Boston. Um, it's alarming that we have the same job. Um, our mom was a nurse uh, at St. Gabriel's Hospital in Little Falls, and our dad was a junior high uh, grade school teacher at our parish grade school, St. Mary's. Um, so we, we were a very devoted uh, Catholic and Minnesota family, and not just devoted to each other and to church, but very devoted to Minnesota. In fact, all of my siblings, with the exception of Jim and me, all of them live in Minnesota. But it's our thinking that why would you ever ever leave such a beautiful place. Um, I did my undergrad at St. John's University, a Benedictine school in Minnesota. I learned a lot from the Benedictines. One of the things I learned is I didn't have a smidgen of monasticism in my DNA. But I um, then went after a lay volunteer year in Chicago with the Dominicans. And after two years uh, working at Loras College in Dubuque, Iowa, I entered the Congregation of Holy Cross. Um, and I came to Notre Dame as a seminarian in 1987. And I did my seminary training here at the University of Notre Dame and in Santiago, Chile, where I spent uh, a good amount of time in the middle of my seminary studies. Um, I was finally ordained in 1994 in the spring. And my first pastoral assignment was at St. Clement's Parish in Hayward, California. St. Clement's is an amazing place. Um, and it was a wonderful place to learn how to be a priest and uh, what, what folks needed from you and from their priest. Um, I would then later go on to doctoral studies and research at the University of Pittsburgh and in Latin America. And then once finished with that, I arrived right back on campus. And that was a full 16 years ago. I came back in 2001. In fact, I got here a month before 9-11. So, the memory of, of the, the mass on the quadrangle that day on 9-11, on where 10,000 people showed up for an impromptu mass at 3.30 in the afternoon, it really marks my, sort of my, my beginning here at the university and, and the deep sense that I have appreciated about our Catholic character and uh, who we are. 
Since then, I teach in the political science department, uh, and for 10 years I had the privilege of running the Center for Social Concerns, which is a large community-based learning, community-based research center here on, on campus where we focus on Catholic social tradition. That was an amazing time, um, and I was, I was grateful to be a part of it and to be part of that conversation. Um, and today, as Kevin mentioned, I serve in this relatively new office called Mission Engagement and Church Affairs. Mission Engagement and Church Affairs, the office, uh, it's a long title, um, and we weren't trying to be ambiguous, but it's actually quite, um, quite specific. Um, on the mission engagement side, our office is trying to help to facilitate a deeper conversation at the University of Notre Dame around issues of importance to the church. Um, and you can think of a thousand ways we do that, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those ways later. But, um, and then on the, on the church affairs side, um, my office assists uh, with the liaising between um, the Congregation of Holy Cross, our founding religious community, the U.S. bishops and the, the U.S. church and its affiliates, and uh, the Vatican. And I also help to oversee the Tantur Ecumenical Institute in Jerusalem. So that's more or less what my office does. So I'm excited to be here for, for obvious reasons and in part because of my role. I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit about um, our enduring Catholic character as a university. So now let me turn to that little brief history that I talked about. And I'm, I'm happy to tell you that I, I brought pictures. So it's going to make it a little easier for you. So um, with that, we'll turn to uh, some of those pictures. Notre Dame, friends, is a Catholic university, and we take that very seriously and have ever since our beginnings. You may know that universities had their origin as Catholic as they grew up in, the medieval, in medieval Europe. Uh, the first notion of a Catholic university grew out of the search for truth, the search for God. Um, the university is a place where faith and reason come together in pursuit of truth. And most of you may know this, but generally speaking, there are two sorts of Catholic universities. Uh, diocesan on the one hand, and those run by a religious community on the other, like the Jesuits or Franciscans or Dominicans. And Notre Dame is, of course, a Holy Cross institution founded by and guided by the Congregation of Holy Cross since its very beginnings. This is our founder, the founder of the Congregation of Holy Cross, Blessed Basil Anthony Mary Moreau. He thought a lot about education, and his thinking is right at the heart of who we've become at Notre Dame and how we educate. Mero was born and raised in France in the aftermath of the French Revolution when institutions were in disarray. Education and the church were in shambles. And Moreau, over time, wanted to bring together a band of folks who would be concerned about the education of young people. So with the help of Father Jacques Dujardier, who had founded a small group of brothers, he would bring together a congregation of priests and brothers and later sisters modeled on the Holy Family. And his idea was to lift people out of poverty, the poverty of their circumstances, especially through education. And Ave Crux Space Unica was the motto that he would give this new congregation. Hail the cross, our only hope. The congregation is actually named for a small town in France, Saint-Croix. We could have been the congregation of Pittsburgh, but gratefully we were founded in Saint-Croix. <laughs> Moreau is one who instilled in us that we need to educate the whole person. He said this, we will accept the discoveries of science without prejudice and in a manner adapted to the needs of our times. We will always place education side by side with instruction. The mind will not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. While we prepare useful citizens for society, we shall likewise do our utmost to prepare citizens for eternal life. So you see that our aim from the very beginning is not just to form really, really smart people. It's to form really smart people who have a heart for the other, who are open, compassionate, and welcoming, and committed to those on the margins. People like Christ. That's at the heart of a Holy Cross education wherever we teach or minister. We've come a long way from Moreau's meager beginnings. And today we're an international congregation that spans the entire globe. Our superior general is in Rome, um, but our religious are elsewhere in Europe, in Africa and Asia and North and South America. As most of you know, 
Um, Holy Cross arrived at South Bend in 1842. Father Edward Soren with six brothers arrived um, on a snowy November day. And this is more or less what that arrival would have looked like. Well, except for maybe that sweet little French carriage. I'm guessing that <laughs> might have been, it might have been a little more rugged for them. But Soren immediately claimed this place for Our Lady. And he named it L'Université de Notre Dame du Lac, the University of Our Lady of the Lake. Edward Soren, for his part, and by all accounts, was a force of nature. He was about 28 years old, and he started to generate a vision that would create what has become one of the most prominent Catholic universities in the world, and arguably the one with the most beautiful campus, which he fundamentally shaped from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, Soren was preoccupied with establishing and building this place. Just 11 days after he got here, Soren would write a letter to Basil Moreau, who had sent him, our superior general and the founder, to plead his cause for this place. As he writes this to Father Moreau, Beloved Father, when we least dreamed of it, we were offered an excellent piece of property, about 640 acres in extent. This land is located in the, in the county of St. Joseph on the banks of the St. Joseph River, not far from the city of South Bend. It is delight, a delightfully quiet place, about 20 minutes from South Bend. The attractive spot has taken from the lake, which its name from the lake, which surrounds it, um, Notre Dame du Lac. It is from here that I write you now. And then after describing their arrival to Father Moreau, Soren goes on to talk about the beauty of their surroundings and their faith in divine providence. And then he pleads with him. Will you permit me, dear Father, to share with you a preoccupation which gives me no rest? Briefly, it is this. Notre Dame du Lac was given to us by the bishop only on condition that we establish here a college at the earliest opportunity, as there is no other school within more than 100 miles. This college cannot fail to succeed. Before long, it will develop on a large scale. It will be one of the most powerful means for good in this country. Finally, dear father, Soren says, you cannot help see that this new branch of your family is destined to grow under the protection of Our Lady of the Lake and of St. Joseph. At least that is my hope, my conviction. Time will tell if I am wrong. And grow this branch did, as Soren surrounded himself with men and women, lay and religious, who would help him create an academic community to serve the education needs of the region. He had an amazing ability to bring people around his vision. Collaboration and welcome from the start marked the community of educators, some famous and some obscured by time, but educators that punctuate the history of this place. One of the famous ones, for instance, was Father Julius Newland, who was a professor of chemistry and botany at Notre Dame in the 20s and 30s. Father Newland essentially invented synthetic rubber, to which, unfortunately, DuPont would later get the patent. I keep wondering what, what to imagine if we'd actually have held on to that patent. <laughs> Another is, is Father John Zahm, um, for whom, obviously, Zahm Hall is named. John Zahm was a scientist, a theologian, and a, had a great love for literature. He taught for years at Notre Dame and was the first to expand on evolution in the Catholic context, giving talks all over the country. Zahm was also a friend of President Theodore Roosevelt. You see the two of them together here. Zahm went on a South American expedition with Roosevelt in the early 1900s. There's a great book about the affair called The River of Doubt, and it's worth a read. Unfortunately, it's there that you'll learn that Zam made a few costly logistical errors on that expedition and was ultimately thrown off it. But don't tell anyone I was the one who told you that. <laughs> Beyond his gift for selling his vision, Soren brought, brought it to life in the buildings that he built. This is an early picture of the first main building, which was built in 1865. That's just 23 years from the humble log chapel to this. And they used bricks made from the mud of the lakes on campus. 
and nearly the entire university was housed in this building. It was the largest academic for, for miles around. But just 14 years later, this building would be engulfed by flames and gutted by fire. This was in the late spring of 1879. No one was killed in the fire, but the school year was suspended and all the students were sent home for an early start to their summer. This, you can imagine, was a dark moment in Notre Dame's history. Soren wasn't even on campus at the time. He was traveling to France for one of his many fundraising trips and was retrieved by his dearest friend in Holy Cross. The community had sent him to break the news because they were so afraid of how Soren would receive it. And the two of them immediately returned then to South Bend. Once back, Soren gathered everyone in the Church of the Sacred Heart, now the Basilica, which itself was not even quite completed by then. And many thought he'd come in and perhaps he'd come in and perhaps call it quits. But instead he announced to them all, I came here as a young man to build a university to honor Our Lady, and she had to burn it down to let me know that we'd built it too small. And so the building of the bigger, bolder main building began and was amazing and was completed at the end of that same fall, allowing students to return that same year for, uh, for the school year. But Soren was no dummy. He also tripled the fire department. <laughs> but Notre Dame, friends, has not always been so pristine and well-groomed as we experience it today. For many years, um, the lakes were a swampy mess and, uh, from which we, we made the bricks. Uh, a lot of the place around the campus looked very untidy. But over time, the campus grew, and especially under the leadership of these two, Father Ted Hesburgh and, and Father Ned Joyce, who guided Notre Dame as president and executive vice president for 35 years. They essentially created the modern master plan for our campus and for the university as a whole. Notre Dame as a Catholic university grew enormously in both physical size as well as in reputation under their leadership. Most know Father Ted for the leader that he was, some calling him the second founder of the University of Notre Dame. And most know well, too, how Father Ted was also involved with many issues beyond the campus, including civil and human rights, peace building, poverty alleviation, Catholic higher education, immigration, atomic energy, and more. Father Ted's passing a couple years ago was another iconic moment on this campus. And it brought former students and uh, all the way to world leaders to the celebration. I had the privilege of helping to organize that event, and it's hard to overstate how meaningful it was to gather together with so many people who um, so deeply respected Father Ted. And to have this community in particular come together, uh, one that he had so much in, in shaping and forming. Uh, I, I dare say no one in recent times has left a more lasting mark on this place, nor on Catholic higher education, frankly, than Father Ted Esper. Holy Cross leadership today comes through many forms, including Father John Jenkins, our president. Father John was inaugurated 12 years ago, and in his inauguration address, he said this, let us rise up and embrace the mission of our time to build a Notre Dame that is bigger and better than ever, a Catholic university for the 21st century, one of the preeminent research institutions in the world, a place of learning where intellectual and religious traditions converge to make it a healing, unifying, enlightening force for a world deeply in need. And under Father John's leadership and his predecessors, Father Monk Malloy's as well, the university has continued to grow in, in so many impressive ways. With, we have a good, good number of Holy Cross religious and priests on campus today who play any number of roles here, including faculty, administrators, pastoral ministers, rectors in our dorms, various other things. You can't get very far around here um, without running into a priest or a seminarian 
Um, and you can't talk to many alumni who ha haven't uh, forged a lovely bond with, with one of them as well. And with regard to our goals as an academic institution, Notre Dame is steeped in the Catholic intellectual tradition. That is steeped in a 2,000 year old conversation between the church and the world. It's a dialogue between the Christian community of believers and the culture in which we find ourselves. While the tradition is broader and older than any university, in large part Notre Dame and other Catholic universities have served as the stewards of this conversation, preserving, transmitting, and developing it by engaging the questions and challenges of this day and time. This is where faith and reason come together in the search for truth, in search of God. Gerard Manley Hopkins, a Jesuit priest and poet, put it this way, the world is charged with the grandeur of God, so truth must be reverenced in whatever way it discloses itself. In this search for truth, Notre Dame, through all of its scholarly efforts in the sciences and literature and theology and every other discipline, has benefited from and contributed to the Catholic intellectual tradition. And the very nature of a Catholic university implies a welcome of all. Here's how our mission statement articulates it. What the university asks of all its scholars and students is not a particular creedal affiliation, but a respect for the objectives of Notre Dame and a willingness to enter into the conversation that gives it life and character. Therefore, the university insists upon academic freedom that makes open discussion and inquiry possible. So academic freedom is, is essential to us and helps us to get to the truth that faith and research can teach us. And it's the case that the university is, is sometimes admonished, I realize, for, for this, um, as it sometimes means we will bring people to campus that don't think with the church. But the willingness to allow contrary views to be expressed and heard and debated does not rise from any relativism about truth or a weakening of faith. It arises from a confidence that through respectful, reasoned dialogue, the truth of faith will be illumined and strengthened. In the words of Ex Corte Ecclesiae, the university is the primary and privileged place for a fruitful dialogue between the gospel and culture. A dialogue is only possible if we do not exclude those who have other views. And we believe that Catholic teaching has nothing to fear from engaging the wider culture. But the culture has something to fear if it is never engaged by Catholic teaching. And we engage in questions of every sort at Notre Dame. We enter the conversation between faith and reason by delving into countless important issues and topics into various disciplines. Consider, for, for instance, our Notre Dame researchers at the Harper Cancer Research Institute who are developing portable tools to diagnose cancers, ultimately serving people in poor, forgotten, and medically under-resourced areas of the world. Or the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, where they are drawing on the church's teachings on war, peace, and human rights. The Kroc Institute is the leading research center in the United States, focusing on strategies for sustainable peace. It shouldn't surprise you that Notre Dame is the leader in adult stem cell research, offering hope for the regeneration of tissues and organs and the curing of diseases, all in accordance with the church's teaching. Our economics department has worked with Catholic charities to establish the Lab for Economic Opportunities to devise, to devise research-driven policies to reduce systemic poverty throughout America. And the Alliance for Catholic Education works in this country, of course, but works in Haiti, too, to improve the lives of two million children and the future of an entire nation by making quality education accessible to all. And our Master of Divinity program is one of the nation's premier ministry program. It's training and lay and ordained ministers together for the service of the church. And the Tantur Ecumenical Institute, um, Pope Paul VI entrusted this institute to the University of Notre Dame in 1967. And it continues to be an international ecumenical institute for theological research and pastoral studies for Christians, Jews, and Muslims. 
And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Center for Social Concerns where I served for all those years. Notre Dame has 80% of its students participating in service during their time here as students. And the center helps those students learn and apply Catholic social teaching and real life experiences in the United States and around the world. Friends, I could go on and on about the other substantive ways that exist right now where Notre Dame is contributing to this conversation and deepening our own Catholic character. But I'll let that suffice for now until the question and answer period. This picture is a picture of um, Our Lady of Mercy Chapel of Geddes Hall. Geddes is where the Institute for Church Life and the Center for Social Concerns are housed. In the side windows of this chapel, saints who emulate the corporal work of mercy are depicted. And those windows are not shown here right now. Well, we intentionally left the two empty windows that you see on either side of the Blessed Mother to emphasize each of our own responsibility to live lives like the saints and to end up in one of those windows someday. Someone who has been a part of the Notre Dame Project, um, as everyone who's been a part of the Notre Dame Project has made a contribution. And so I wanted to close um, by thanking you for adding your voice as often as not to, to the conversation at Notre Dame. So now I'm delighted to, to turn to some of the questions that folks have offered. Thanks so much, Father Bill. Uh, a really interesting look at the university's history and how our Catholic character continues to um, define everything, all the work that's done here on campus. Um, for those of you watching live, just a reminder now, Father Bill is going to be taking your questions. You can submit questions using the form just beneath the streaming player where you're watching us. Submit them throughout the, uh, the remainder of the program, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, Father Bill, to start, you know, we said at the top your, uh, your title here is Vice President for Church Affairs and Mission Engagement. When I think about church affairs, I think it's naturally to, to think about the top uh, of the mm -hmm. church, the, the highest level of leadership. So how is Notre Dame supporting Pope Francis? And, um, you know, does Notre Dame interact much with the Vatican? You know, it's funny, I, Kevin, I took this job nearly five years ago. And one of the first things that I was asked to, to do was to try to help arrange for a meeting with Pope Francis for our trustees and for our um, university officers. That's not an easy thing to do. I was, I was like, what? I have to do that? <laughs> so I worked with a number of folks. We actually approached it at, at numerous angles, and, and it was tough. Um, for one thing, Pope Francis was unpredictable. He was um, meeting with some folks that people didn't expect him to, um, meeting with others that they thought he would. I remember we, we had heard in the middle of trying to get this meeting that he uh, had met with a group of, on, in St. Peter's Square, a large group of Harley Davidson bikers on their bikes. And I thought to myself, wow, if, he, if, he, if he's going to meet with the bikers, I sure hope he'll meet with us. <laughs> Well, thankfully, um, Cardinal Donald Whirl of Washington, D.C. was ever so helpful to us, and we're so grateful. And we were ultimately able to arrange for a visit in January of 2014 um, with the Board of Trustees uh, and the officers of the university in the Apostolic Palace right at the Vatican. And we spent a good, I bet he was with us almost an hour. It was impressive, and he greeted each one. He, there's a certain awesomeness about the man and the way he communicates, and, and that really came through. Um, so that, that's just one little, when you said we have, you know, you want to go right to the top. So I went right <laughs> to the top. But there are so many other ways that we engage the church. I, I, think, of, um, I think of all the ways that uh, we, we have probably a half a dozen scholars for sure who are on different Vatican commissions. We engage regularly through the work of the university, various, um, various institutes and congregations of the Vatican. We have scholars continually going over to participate in conferences. I think of Father John, who, was, who presented a paper on higher education uh, just last year. There's two projects, though, that are particularly impressive when it comes to our relationship with the Vatican. One I just mentioned very briefly, and it's the Tantur Ecumenical Institute. Tantur actually was born out of um, the meeting of Pope Paul VI with Athanagoras, who was the Greek patriarch. And this happened in 1964. 
And friends, this was the first time that the Pope of the Latin Church, of the Roman Catholic Church, and the Greek Patriarch had come together in nearly a thousand years. This was a momentous occasion. Pope Paul VI wanted to memorialize uh, this moment through the construction of and the creation of an institute that would work towards greater ecumenical dialogue. And so he asked Father Ted Hesburgh to work with him to create this, and thus was born the Tantor Ecumenical Institute. And because of that institute, we're working with several congregations around ecumenism and, and interfaith dialogue. Um, we have a more recent partnership that's been very exciting for a lot of our faculty and, and for a lot of us. It's with the Vatican Library. So the Vatican Library, um, you can't even imagine what a treasure the Vatican Library is. There's, they say that 90% of uh, their holdings have not been looked at in over 100 years. Um, they have just an impressive, enormous, it's like the attic of civilization. And we have signed a 10-year memorandum of understanding where we are working deeply with the Vatican Library and scholars are going back and forth and, and they're engaging our global gateway in Rome as well. So, so suffice it to say, there are many and, and substantive contacts with, uh, with the Vatican and, and we're grateful even more recently, some of our students are getting internships throughout the Vatican. So it's, it's an exciting time and, and uh, we have a deep partnership. That's, that's extremely interesting. Um, I think we're, we're ready to go to our first question from the audience here. Got a question queued up here from Bill. In the latter part of the 20th century, Notre Dame was often accused to have lost its Catholic character. How is the university proactively addressing this issue? You know, Notre Dame is a robustly, robustly Catholic place, but it is absolutely the case that we have to remain vigilant um, as we work on deepening our Catholic character. You know, the top 20 universities in this country started as faith-based institutions, and of those 20, Notre Dame is the only one that is deeply committed to its founding uh, religious affiliation. That matters to us, and we're, gonna, we're utterly committed to, to keeping that uh, the case. But there are various ways that we do that, right? We are committed to a preponderance of Catholic faculty. We have, uh, we will hire we will always have a preponderance of Catholic faculty on our, on our faculty. Um, we have also um, brought beautiful faculty together who are simply from all kinds of faiths, who are deeply committed to our, our religious tradition and to our mission. Um, you know, but it's not enough for us to just bring faculty here, right? We have to give them opportunities to deepen their faith. Some people come because we're a Catholic university. We need to make sure we're giving them everything they need to live lives of integrity and, and uh, deep faith. So recently, in the last three years, we've actually developed a, a, a faculty chaplaincy program. Now that seems pretty ordinary, I suppose, but here at the University of Notre Dame, we have so many religious that we sort of rested on our laurels and just expected faculty to, to um, engage priests and others as they, as they came upon them. But we have fewer faculty um, religious, but we also have a much, much larger and more complex organization. So this new chaplaincy program, which has engaged numerous um, religious from our congregation, is really an important piece of that. It's uh, with retreats and days of recollection and the rest. We're also developing um, institutes and, and, and programs and workshops for our faculty to deepen their understanding of what it means to be a uh, a Catholic institution and, and what is the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, we have a lot of faculty who are interested but may not be Catholic or are Catholic and would like to be more deeply committed to, to what we're up to. So we have developed, for instance, one program called the, the Soren Institute. This Soren, it's the Soren Seminar for Faculty. Uh, this is a, a seminar that, that meets right after graduation and brings together a good number of mid-level faculty. And it's a three-day three seminar where we bring uh, scholars from around the university to talk about their own commitment, but also to talk about the ways that uh, the Catholic intellectual life should play a role here at the university and what it means for us to be a Holy Cross institution, to be a Catholic university. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I think is most special, and this shouldn't surprise us, is uh, our students. Our students are amazingly faithful. Over 80% of our students are, are Catholic. Um, and will and will remain uh, that way. And 
I, sometimes, I know we, we get some critique for not being Catholic enough. Sometimes I wish I could bring folks here to, uh, to wander the campus, for one, but, but also to celebrate. I have the privilege of living in Alumni Hall with the, the dogs of alumni. And uh, our 10 o'clock Sunday Night Mass is, is just jammed. And it's just amazing music, all led by the students. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful place to worship. We have a very rich, faithful, liturgical life on this campus, and, and uh, most of our students are involved with it. In fact, there are 115 masses each week on this campus. Now, that's, that's astounding. That's more than um, many, many dioceses would have in one week. So it, it's, it's stellar how committed the university is. I might say just one more thing, because I have the privilege of being on the uh, President's Leadership Council. But I'm in many, many meetings here with the President's Leadership Council, but with, in various other meetings with high-ranking folks. And it's rare that, that a time goes by when we're not um, conversing about and, and thinking about our Catholic character and what that means and how that should be reflected in the decisions we make. So. Um, we're not taking this lightly. We, this is something serious. And I know people will not always agree with uh, a direction we take here or there, but, but it's not for lack of, of a commitment. Um, so. Well, Father Bill, thanks so much. And I think, you know, as a, as a former Notre Dame student uh, a long time ago myself and someone who gets to talk to so many um, alumni through my role at the Alumni Association, the, your point about uh, dorm masses cannot be, I think, lost on anyone who's yeah. experienced that. So many folks cite that as one of the really special mm -hmm. parts of their experience of their time here on campus. So yeah. um, thanks. I think we're ready for another question from the from the audience here. This one, uh, let's see, comes in from Michael. Michael asks, how many Holy Cross religious are at Notre Dame now? What is the community doing to increase, uh, I think that should say, vocations, mm -hmm. he means, and, um, and how can we help? We have roughly 70 priests on campus today, which is a really good number. And... Um, and they're serving uh, in, as I said, in, as rectors and faculty and administrators uh, in campus ministry as chaplains elsewhere. Um, we have fully 55 uh, young men in our formation program as well, many of whom are here studying theology. So we, it's really a, a, a nice, um, we have a nice amount of Holy Cross involved here at the university. Um, you know, almost as importantly, though, as to, to Holy Cross is the University of Notre Dame probably sends out multiple times more young men and women who are going to join religious communities throughout the country. Um, and they are called to different, you know, different communities, different charisms, but they were nurtured here. And uh, I don't think it's in any small part because of the, the rich Catholic tradition of this place. So that's, that's a beautiful part of, uh, of our commitment and, and our, our way to serve the church. You know, when you, when you ask about how, how uh, we can be helped in this, I think um, the, the, the most important way that anyone can help with vocations today is just to raise beautiful families and to give them a deep appreciation for the church and, and for what it's trying to do and, and for the Lord. Um, and to encourage young people, whether they're your kids or not, uh, to think about a religious vocation or diocesan priesthood. It's, it's an, a really important piece of, uh, of the church's history, and, and, and it's an even more important part of our future. Um, and the last thing, and I, I ask you to do this, is to pray, to pray for vocations, um, pray for uh, just a deepening of our own commitment to our own vocations, because I think... Um, if we know one thing, we know for sure that uh, prayer is right at the heart of what we need to be doing. So, A quick reminder for those of you watching live, Father Bill's taking your questions. You can submit them using the form just beneath the, uh, the streaming player where you're watching us. And let's go to our next uh, question from the audience here. This comes from Jim. Uh, why did the university invite Vice President Pence to be the commencement speaker this year and to receive an honorary degree? Why do you invite people who have disagreed with the university on some issues? We invited um, Vice President Pence, as Father John said, because um, in this 175th year of, of the University of Notre Dame, it was important for us to, and, and almost poetic, to invite um, a native son of, of Indiana. Uh, Mike Pence is a, a, a man of integrity who's, who's a, a real statesman, and he, is a, he has worked very hard 
for the state of, of Indiana. So I, th I think we're very pleased that he'll, he'll be able to join us. It is absolutely the case that uh, we have people here once in a while that, that not everyone's um, utterly enthusiastic about. Um, but I, I hearken back to what I was saying earlier, that if we're going to have a dialogue, we, we need to be able to bring in folks um, from who have different ideas, different ways of thinking than we do. If we only listened to each other and only listened to sort of an, all of those who completely agreed with us, we, we'd become a very sort of hollow um, shell. So I, I think it's, it's really important for us to be able to, to bring um, various people to the campus. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's take another question from the audience here. This one's from Kevin, a nice name. Uh, I've heard statistics about young people leaving the church. What is Notre Dame doing to keep young people connected to the Catholic faith? You know, it's interesting. We have a um, sociology professor here on campus, quite famous, Christian Smith, um, who has done some really important work on, um, on uh, emerging adults uh, and church. And he has found, this is fascinating to me. He, you know, in the old days, we used to think that it was almost a rite of passage that young people would sort of you know, fall away from the church a little bit in college or shortly after. But almost invariably, they would come back when they started to have children and, and they would become re-engaged with the church. Unfortunately, we're not finding that to be the case anymore. And in fact, what Christian has found is that if, if a person leaves the church in their 20s, uh, stops worshiping, stops engaging, it's very unlikely that they will come back. Um, but on the other hand, if they stay engaged through their 20s, they're very likely to remain for, for the long haul and to introduce their own children to the church. You can imagine what, what a responsibility it is then for us at the University of Notre Dame, for all Catholic college universities and Newman centers and everyone else working with, with young people because it's, it's absolutely essential that we, we keep people engaged and invested in the church. Um, and so that's a big part of our role. Now, we are looking at all kinds of ways to do that. And um, Notre Dame, we, we feel a deep responsibility to make sure that we're doing that in, in sort of a larger context. So there's a couple of projects that bear mentioning uh, it, you know, in light of this question. Um, you know how young people today are living in uh, an alternate universe that is the web and online? And for most of us, not you, Kevin, but most of my age and over, we have, we have very, we have like, we're like aliens to that land. And I, I, what I happen to know is that there's a lot of funny cat videos, but I also happen to know there's very little challenging or um, inspiring faith content there. So we have begun uh, the Catholic Media Project, which is a, an amazing project that we hope will help to re-engage millennials, folks from about 18 to 35, in a conversation with the church. And ultimately, I, this is an audacious goal, um, to, to nudge them back into their own parishes and their own church life. Um, and we'll do this through a multi-platform digital media offering, much as, as the University of Notre Dame has done through Fighting Irish Digital Media for Athletics, and that is filling the airwaves with important content that, that leads the story. We'd like to fill the airwaves with uh, important, challenging, inspiring faith content. So, so we're working on that project. It, it'll roll out in a number of months, but, but we're very excited about that. We have another really interesting project uh, that we've just begun to develop in Ireland. Um, the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, uh, approached Father John and asked him that if he would, if Notre Dame would assume responsibility for the university church on St. Stephen's Green. This is the church that John Cardinal Newman founded. It is, it is an amazing thing that the Archbishop has asked us to take on the responsibility, not just of staffing that church, but to begin a, a, a conversation with young Irish people, young professionals, and bringing them back into a conversation with the church and, and faith and reason. And how, how does their life, how does their young professional life or their, their academic life relate to what's going on in the, in the world and to the church um, and to faith? Um, so we have, so it will, it's called the, the, the uh, Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason. We have sent Father Bill Daly, who's a law professor from here, who has just moved to 
Dublin to take on this program, to direct it. And with him is, is Steve Warner, who for 35 years um, directed our full choir, who's taken up residence there with his wife, Michelle, and they will lead uh, the liturgical musical piece of this. Um, we can already see, they've only been there a number of months, but we can already see some excitement and some, some energy. Um, young people today really want um, to engage the faith. Often they don't know how or, or haven't found um, uh, the sort of venue that they need. And so we're, we're, at Notre Dame, we take very seriously this opportunity. And I mean, the truth is, if, if we do anything well, it's, it's educate young people. So we feel a responsibility to go far beyond here to be helpful in the evangeliz evangelization of those folks. Well, those are definitely some, some really exciting projects the university's taken on that we can all uh, look forward to, to learning more about and seeing the, the fruits of those labors. Um, Let's take another question from our audience here. Greg, uh, Greg asks, the events on campus after Father Hesburgh's death were so beautiful and wonderfully done. What went into that planning process? Do you know, when I took uh, this job uh, five years ago, Father Ted was probably, he was 94, and um, 94, 95. And I was handed a file this thick, and they said, Father Bill, we'd like you to take on with, you know, with the team of folks, um, the coordination of Father Ted Hesburgh's funeral. And I thought, wow. And then they handed me that file and they said, and you will benefit from Father Ted having outlived three of these previous committees. <laughs> and I thought, great. Um, I'll tell you, um, there have been few projects in my life uh, that I have been more honored to be a part of and um, that have been easier in some ways. Um, there is a great affection for Father Hesburgh here at Notre Dame, but, but far, far beyond. Uh, the impact that man has had is just astounding. And um, you could, people could not get to you fast enough, right? And the coordination of bringing in the lovely Hesburgh family and its uh, the extended family, the the all the Holy Cross religious, but the thousands of others, uh, and it was sort of unpredictable, the thousands of others to come in to the university for that um, was amazing. And there wasn't a person on this campus in university events, um, development, uh, student affairs, everywhere. Everybody uh, really took it seriously. It was great. Um, I think the most iconic moment for me um, as a Holy Cross religious was um, every time um, a Holy Cross religious dies uh, in our province, we bring them to the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. That is our, our center. And um, we have the funeral, and, and then we go out from the church, and we all walk from the church to the cemetery, which is probably a mile away, three-quarters of a mile. And the hearse is in the back. Well, on this day... We walked out, and uh, you can imagine all the dignitaries and others who were there. And so we walked out as Holy Cross. The Hesburgh family came, and then and then the the hearse. Um, and I remember seeing many people right around the casket, as or right around our group as we were coming out. And I, and as we sort of came over the crescent of the hill, um, just at the end of Corby Hall, looking toward the lakes, I looked over the hill, and I could see thousands of people lining the roads, uh, the road right to the cemetery, which was just overwhelmingly powerful. And uh, it was indicative of the impact Father Hesburgh has had and, and what he calls out of us, I think. N most of them were students, none of whom uh, would have known. They were born after Father Ted retired as president to the university, of the university. So um, it really was uh, an amazing opportunity for the university to come together and to, to demonstrate what it means to be a great Catholic university. It was definitely a, an amazing and, and moving time on campus. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to, we're, we're running a little low on time, so let's see if we can get a couple more questions in here. Uh, this question's from Charlie. How do non-Catholic students at Notre Dame participate in the university's Catholic mission? Do you know, we, as I mentioned, we 80% of our students are um, Catholic. Another, you know, the, the rest are, are from other Christian faith, faiths and, and from other religions. But we engage them in various ways. Um, we're very attentive, to, especially to our, our um, well, to our Protestant non-Catholic students. I mean, um, campus ministry makes available to all of them um, regular um, 
church service opportunities and even transportation for them. But we also have um, the Growing Croc Institute and uh, the, uh, the new Keogh School for Global Affairs is a wonderful opportunity for us to, as a community, to engage with other faiths and everything else. So this place becoming a more and more global university, um, I think makes it easier and more comfortable for everyone. Um, it's funny, many of our, our um, students will, uh, non-Catholic students will attend even our masses on Sunday because that becomes such a, a wonderful place for worship um, in, our, in our halls. I was actually in Philadelphia this past weekend to do the wedding of a young man. Um, he and his older brother and younger brother all lived in Alumni Hall, not of the Catholic faith. The three of them came to mass in Alumni Hall every Sunday. And so here's Will's getting married. He writes to me and he says, Father, I'd like you to do my wedding. And I'm thinking to myself, well, Will, you're not even Catholic. He said, I found a wonderful Catholic girl. <laughs> so it was, it was really something. So I'll tell you, there, is a, there are wonderful ways that, that we are engaging. And it's really important for us to have um, those folks. And the graduate school, too. We, we have a, a great number of folks from other traditions. And it's important for, for our students to have that. So. Great. Uh, another question here coming in from the audience. This is from Danielle. How does the Campus Crossroads, uh, the Campus Crossroads project, align with uh, Notre Dame's Catholic mission? I'm uh, a big fan of the Crossroads project, and I, I know that there are some who are critical of it, and some who have even gone so far as to say that, um, um, well, I think the worry for some is that it's mo that somehow is moving the center of our campus from uh, the, you know, the God Quad or, or the Basilica and the main building over to the football stadium, which is just not the case. Uh, the truth is, in our strategic planning and in the laying out of the next capital campaign, the buildings that are being built around the stadium were in that capital campaign. And from, from my part, I'm just so thrilled that we're not going to build a new quad shooting out south of the stadium with uh, a whole array of new buildings, but instead coming right around the stadium. It's called the Crossroads Project because it is the crossroads of athletics, um, student life, and academics. That's, that's where the crossroads is. And, and when, you, when we talk about our Catholic mission, and I was saying earlier about Basil Moreau and, and really fundamentally who we are, it's really about the integration of the whole person. It's, it's, um, it's faith, it's, um, it's your life, it's, it's all these things, your, your um, scholarship. So I actually see the, the Crossroads Project as a wonderful sort of epitome of, of that integration. And, and right at the heart of our Catholic mission. This is what we're trying to do on this campus. So, and not to mention the fact that they're, they're quite beautiful buildings. Enormous, yes, but, but quite beautiful. I think, I think it'll be an attractive, uh, attractive project, so. Absolutely, and excited for people to, to come to campus in the fall and, yeah. and, uh, and see those. Well, Father Bill, um, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time. We want to thank everyone who, who joined us live and to all of you watching later on My Notre Dame and on YouTube. Remember, if you want to watch future episodes, of all of our online learning programs at the Alumni Association or to watch past episodes, you can visit us at my.nd.edu slash learn or go on YouTube and search for the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Father Bill, thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time out today and, and walking us through this, this discussion of, uh, of such an important uh, a topic. And, and thank you for all the work you do uh, at the university to uh, continue to guide us and, and shepherd our, uh, our Catholic mission here. Uh, any, any final thoughts to leave us with today? You know, I, I, I would like to, to just end with a quote from Father Soren. It's a, it's, it comes from a letter that Soren wrote to Basil Moreau, the founder, um, in some of the darkest, earliest days. And it's just this beautiful quote, and I, 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 it's worthy of, of sharing with you. Um, Soren writes to Moreau, Yes, we are happy. We have the Lord with us. Only tonight we hung our sanctuary lamp where none had hung before. They tell us we won't be able to afford to keep it burning, but we have a little olive oil, and it will burn while it lasts. We can see it through the woods, and it lights the humble home where our master dwells. We tell each other that we are not alone, that Jesus Christ lives among us. It gives us courage. You know, we, keep, we continue to keep that light burning, Kevin, and, and it gives us courage. So I'm very grateful to have had this chance to be with your folks and to be with you. I appreciate your giving some attention to this piece. Thanks, Thanks. so much, Father Bell. All right.